Hi, I'm Brent Stafford, and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. Has the battle over safer nicotine products settled into stalemate? Public health policy on vaping appears ossified and focused solely on preventing youth uptake. At the same time, tobacco harm reduction proponents maintain adults should have ubiquitous access to safer nicotine products in various forms and flavors. Is there a middle ground? Joining us today to answer this question are two esteemed tobacco control scholars and favorite guests on RegWatch, Dr. Kenneth Warner, Dean Emeritus and Professor Emeritus at the School of Public Health, University of Michigan, and Cliff Douglas, adjunct professor also at the School of Public Health, University of Michigan, and former Vice President for Tobacco Control at the American Cancer Society. Gentlemen, thanks for coming back on the show. Great thanks to be here. Thank you. So today we're discussing a new paper that you both are co-authors on and it was published in Health Affairs titled A Proposed Policy Agenda for Electronic Cigarettes in the U.S. Product, Price, Place and Promotion. Dr. Warner, let's start with you. What's the purpose behind this paper? Well, you started out by talking about the fact that we have a lot of controversy about the, the subject of e-cigarettes in this country. And you noted that we have uh, a policy, and I say this country, I'm referring to the U.S., we have a series of policies that are oriented toward trying to get kids not to use e-cigarettes. Uh, that has implications both for the kids, some of them, by the way, good, some not so good. And it has implications for adults, particularly for adult smokers, and they turn out to be not such good consequences. What we wanted to do is address the fact that almost everyone in the public health community shares two goals in common. They want to keep all nicotine and tobacco products out of the hands and mouths of kids. And they also want to help as many adult smokers to quit as is possible. We thought we should look for a series of policies, a policy mix, if you will, that is oriented toward addressing both objectives at the same time. That was the purpose of the paper, to get a conversation going, if nothing else. Cliff, let me ask you, do you think that there is a middle ground? I think there is middle ground, and and as Ken has started with, it's it's possible that uh, a good, comprehensive, thoughtful uh, set of uh, principles that involve a certain degree of compromise that would remove us from the sort of typical daily polarized approaches that we see in this, you know, in the coverage of this issue and the way that people are advocating around this issue. I think it's quite possible, and I know uh, that you know based on decades as a, call it a kind of a traditional tobacco control uh, policy expert and an advocate, as I've been, uh, going back to the to the late 80s, and Ken has overlapped and, and gone beyond some of that time period as well, with my interest in promoting uh, a reasonable, appropriate tobacco harm reduction uh, for tens of millions of adults in the U.S. and potentially many more outside of the U.S. at the same time that we uh, pursue some of those conventional tobacco control policy objectives like raising taxes on combustible products and, and reducing the impact of, of marketing on, on everyone, kids, but, but really everyone. There are ways to approach those goals that enable us to, as, as has been said, uh, to chew, you know walk and chew gum at the same time. We don't have to remain so siloed. It seems clear that public health may be fixated on youth use at the expense of adults? Is that, is that really true? I do think that media coverage has generally uh, focused on the concerns around kids access. And we've seen our, in the US, federal health agencies, like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Food and Drug Administration, focus more heavily in their public discourse around the need to protect kids and the, the fact that there was a visible increase statistically in the number of kids in the U.S. around 2018 who were experimenting with these cigarettes and it ended up being kind of transmogrified into uh, being framed as an epidemic, whether or not that was precisely the case uh, technically. And so, you know, yes, that's, that's really primarily been the focus. There have been some good, strong, I think, uh, thoughtful voices 
along the way who have talked about the need to really increase cessation among tens of millions of uh, inveterate uh, cigarette smokers. But, uh, you know, clearly the discourse has been weighted heavily toward the, the, the focus on kids. Cliff just described the, the situation in the U.S. perfectly. But we need to recognize that in at least a few countries, it's quite different. So if we look at the U.K. and New Zealand as probably the two best examples, the governments, the medical organizations, uh, they're all behind e-cigarettes as an available technology to help adults quit smoking. And the conversation there is very different than it is in the U.S. Cliff, you are last on the show in May of 2021, and at that time, you called for a ceasefire within the tobacco control community. Did that happen? Have things gotten any better? Well, let me start with uh, a kind of a simple answer, and I would say, no, we haven't experienced a ceasefire. Um, it's been slower than, than I, and I think many folks, many of us, uh, would have liked to have seen, because I think it's possible that we could all get along better and find more common ground in practical, you know, policy oriented ways than we have. At the same time, I think that we have seen some gradual progress. I think that the media coverage, for example, which was really very one sided about the emphasis on concerns around kids. And let me just add parenthetically there, those concerns have some validity. I'm, I'm the dad of a 19 year old who uh, these days is vaping and doing it rather compulsively, and it raises concern for me. He was not a smoker before that. So these things are real. At the same time, I do think that the media has done, uh, thanks to the efforts of people like Ken Warner and many prominent scientists, experts in this area, a better job of, uh, I think, of advancing discussion around some of these larger concerns having to do with the needs of adults. And I would cite just for example, the coverage from Jennifer Maloney in the Wall Street Journal, which has been sometimes very thoughtful, where these uh, issues are raised and we're having more of a discussion there and more of a recognition that this is not just a simple black and white, one-sided topic. So that's improvement, I think. And Ken, let me ask you, have you seen uh, any improvement in that area or is it still an all-out battle? First of all, I'll tell you a lot of people who resent characterizing it as a battle. So it's uh, predominantly people, I think, on the harm reduction side who characterize it that way, at least publicly. And I think the reason for that is that the other side, which has been the ones who are focused on kids and vaping, have had such a dominant role in the public discourse uh, and the political discourse. So I don't think that I've seen a lot of improvement. I certainly don't think it's gotten any worse recently. I think there may be a, a little bit of uh, less hostility being voiced as publicly as it was at one point. We're seeing some of that frustration. You can imagine in the US when you have FDA actually denying Juul its marketing order and within days or a week or so, they actually have to pull that back and stay that order and there's still all the products are, are available in most states. So is, it, is there not a sense that maybe vaping is too big to fail? That's a really tough one. It's certainly not too big to fail in the sense that the cigarette industry is too big to fail. Uh, it's not too big to fail in the sense that the car industry or the drug industry uh, is too big to fail. But let's face it, there are millions of Americans who are using e-cigarettes there are lots of businesses, small businesses like vape shops up to major tobacco corporations that are selling e-cigarettes. And uh, there's, there's clearly a, enough of a constituency out there that it can't be ignored. Uh, but again, I don't think it's as powerful a constituency as we would see for other, what we would think of as major products made by major industries. Ken, how big of a problem is smoking still in the U.S. in 2022? Well, smoking is actually a terrific success story. Uh, we're not all the way at the, uh, to the end game that everybody is seeking. But if you look at adult smoking, we're down to about 12% of adults. We were up to about 45% when we first uh, began what loosely was called the anti-smoking campaign. 
1964. And at that time, a significant majority of adult males were cigarette smokers. So we've made great progress, and that progress has accelerated in recent years. Uh, we've seen a big decrease. Uh, David Mendez and myself and another colleague recently published a paper in nicotine and tobacco research in which we demonstrated, uh, much to our delight and surprise, that the smoking cessation rate in the United States has increased in the most recent block of years that we looked at. We examined smoking cessation from 1992 through 2019 uh, and 2020 in one instance. And we've seen an increase in the smoking cessation rate. And in the most recent years, it's actually sped up. It has been bigger than we expected based on trend prior to that. When you think about kids, we're seeing an unbelievably low rate of smoking. Smoking has virtually disappeared among kids, particularly cigarette smoking. Some kids are smoking cigarillos and cigars, but even those numbers have been dropping at the same time. So this is a huge success story, and it's, it's almost shocking that we're not talking about it more in public. It's a great success story. Uh, what was the latest figure it was 1.5% of kids said they'd smoked in the last 30 days. I think that was the number, it was something like that. In Canada, it is so low that Health Canada has stopped recording uh, smoking prevalence among youth, teens. Oh, Brent, if I can make an observation there, there's a lot of discussion around the role of industry in all of this. And chances are we'll spend a few minutes during the session chatting about that. You know, it, it, it really strikes one, if they look at it, I think objectively, that when you think about the veracity, or some people will say lack thereof, on the part of at least some cigarette companies, the mo most prominent of which probably would be Philip Morris International, where they have made a real effort to campaign on this theme of aiming toward a smoke-free world. Uh, many people in tobacco control, if not virtually all of them, would say, well, that's a bunch of bunk. There are others who bring, I would suggest, a somewhat more open mind to it. But think about what you've just been talking about. If virtually no kids are smoking cigarettes these days, and not many more are using small cigars, at least we're talking about in the U.S., well, that suggests a huge challenge to the cigarette companies going forward. It would make sense purely from a financial, from an economic perspective, for them really to be planning and looking ahead to a world in which they are selling different types of products that are consumer acceptable and will be successful to them as companies. That certainly doesn't resolve the concern here and the challenge, but it does raise some interesting questions about uh, how to manage this going forward and how those of us in public health might want to start thinking about it. Could that be part of the reason why we've seen such a very intentional, in my mind, process of demonizing nicotine now? It doesn't seem to be the problem is smoking, the problem is nicotine. I think nicotine has been demonized for quite a while. I don't, I don't think we want to say it's just now. Uh, you got to remember, a majority of the adults in America, and it turns out a majority of primary care physicians in America, think it's the nicotine in cigarettes that causes the lung cancer, the pulmonary disease, the heart disease. Uh, there's just a lack of understanding that nicotine is the addictive substance, but it's not the substance that's causing all the disease. And that's why uh, Mitch Zeller, when he was a director of the Center for Tobacco Products and FDA, said that we have to talk about a nicotine continuum of risk, noting that you have the, the most risky product ever developed by human beings on one end of the spectrum, and that's the cigarette. And on the other end, you've got things like nicotine replacement therapy products that are basically, they're not harmless, but they're close to being harmless. And we have to learn, uh, we have to understand that as a nation, in order to make significant progress here. And that's gonna be very difficult to do because people have very entrenched views on it. It is also true and very worrisome to me that there are people in public health who think that nicotine addiction per se is a major public health problem. 
you know, I don't want anybody to be addicted to something they don't want to be addicted to. But I want to focus on what's really critical here. And what's really critical here is inhaling smoke with its 7,000 plus chemicals in the case of cigarettes, uh, 70 known human carcinogens. Um, we're not focusing on that at all. And I think there's actually some good reasons for that. And it's, uh, there are unfortunate reasons. I think, frankly, for the people who matter in our society, the people who are politically engaged, who are socially connected, uh, who are affluent enough to have their word listened to, uh, they don't smoke. And their friends and colleagues don't smoke. There's no smoking in the restaurants uh, that they go into or the bars that they go into. And uh, they seem to think smoking has kind of been resolved. That it's not a problem anymore. Yet in that 12% of Americans who smoke, we see very large rates of smoking among subsets of Americans, those of lower socioeconomic status, certain races, the LGBTQ community, um, it, the mental health community, or mental illness, I should say. Uh, and somehow we've kind of forgotten about those people. And that's why I think it's so important that we do whatever we can to help the remaining smokers who want to quit to do so. I know that many advocates find that a bit perplexing because generally, you know, class issues, race issues, um, you know, identity issues and so forth, all those people seem to be really falling under the ballywick um, in most cases of public health and those that might be more progressive in nature, but they seem to ignore the social justice issue when it comes to tobacco use. Can I just add one point here on that specifically? And I think this is really telling. If you look at the role of smoking and the very substantial difference in life expectancy for the affluent and the poor in this country, smoking may be the single most important behavioral factor, and it may account for a very large proportion of that big difference in life expectancy, differences in smoking rates between the rich and the poor. Now, I want to jump into uh, this current paper that you have out because it will allow us to get into all of these areas a little more deeply. But I want to, right up at the top, if you could explain for us, and this is to either of you, what exactly does the FDA standard for granting marketing approval mean, the appropriate for the protection of public health? The Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and the Tobacco Control Act within it uh, sets forth the standard that uh, they uh, will authorize those products that have been deemed appropriate for protection of the public health. And it's rather a balancing act because at the simplest level, what it's looking at is, will a given product uh, have greater benefit to those adults who might be able to transition off of combustible tobacco products than it might pose risk to youth using this product and being exposed to nicotine who otherwise would not have been. And the calculation also is extended to considering non-smoking adults or even former smokers who might revert to using these products that would be considered a net detriment as opposed to benefit uh, to them. So that's really basically it. Will it do more benefit for the public health uh, than uh, it will place uh, you know, people at risk? And uh, that's, that's really a fundamental question. And thus far, has been the source of a great deal of frustration because of the slow moving nature uh, of this regulatory process and also some of the, the opaque and mystifying uh, you know, parts of this process that we've been observing. And before Ken, uh, let me just one more Cliff, you had mentioned that you've got a son that at 19 is vaping nicotine, but yet was not a smoker previously. Is that behavior not exactly what public health is trying to stop? Under the appropriate for the protection of public health standard, that would be seen as a real problem. And as the parent, just as a parent, uh, with my N of one son, uh, I'm troubled by it. Abs absolutely. Um, I can wax f philosophical about it and, and talk about all of the, the worse, riskier things that my son might do or be exposed to. That would be absolutely correct. But the fact that he's doing something he doesn't need to do that, if anything, will probably cause more harm than good for him is troubling to me. 
And let me just add, um, because here in Canada, of course, anywhere uh, in the country, uh, cannabis is legal and, you know, and delivered and monitored and regulated by Health Canada. So, you know, you're, it seems to be that as a youth who is of age, you know, it seems appropriate that you can decide to be a cannabis user, even though you may not have been before it was legalized. But if you decide to use nicotine through uh, a vaping product, boy, you are kind of lower on the scale. It's just trying to balance these things is difficult. Well, it's, it's very difficult because what, one thing that you've just highlighted, and it's sort of an obvious thing, but it's one that we don't often talk enough about, is the fact that none of these things are occurring in some kind of artificial vacuum. They're occurring in real life with real people, and in the case of kids, with kids who are growing up in complex environments with a lot of challenges, a subset of those kids, a pretty large one, uh, is going to engage in so-called risky behaviors. Sometimes they're gonna be very serious. Sometimes they'll just be passing activities and they're not gonna do harm and they'll just be part of you know, the, the, the experience of growing up. But you know, it involves drinking alcohol. It involves exposure, not only to cannabis, which in many cases may be uh, lawful activity, uh, but also a whole host of other uh, illicit drugs, some of which are extraordinarily dangerous, and as well as the, the wide variety of, of tobacco products, both those that contain tobacco and maybe smoke and those that may not contain tobacco, but nicotine and some other substances. So it's, it's enormously complicated, but we do have to try to get our arms around it, think about it, and act on it as thoughtfully as we possibly can. And going back to sort of the baseline issue that we're discussing today to find common ground, because many of us uh, have kids, many of us, whether we do or don't love kids and care about them, we all know uh, a whole lot of adults, friends, family, colleagues, and we should be looking out for each other and, and really putting this sort of concept of battle aside and finding common ground. Cliff mentioned the other substances that kids use. Uh, one of the issues with e-cigarettes clearly is their novelty. And I think that's one of the concerns, one of the reasons that adults are so concerned. They went from nothing to a very substantial number of kids trying them. Uh, but if we take a look at the data, the number of kids who use marijuana and alcohol is significantly higher than those who are using uh, e-cigarettes, and it has been for decades. I mean, the, the rate of use of marijuana has been over 20% among kids uh, for at least 20 years now. And uh, in all three cases, actually, we're talking about products that are now legal for adults in some states, in the case of marijuana, but in the case of alcohol and uh, tobacco and nicotine products, they are legal for adults. Uh, they've never been legal for kids. And uh, I, I certainly think that alcohol use by kids poses dramatically higher problems uh, than the other substances that are either not used very much, such as very addictive drugs and heroin and so on, uh, or those that are used a lot, but probably with less detrimental implications. Ken, let me ask you this. As we jump into the details of the paper right up at the top here, can you... Can you answer this for us? Are e-cigarettes an effective tool to utilize to quit smoking? If we look at the totality of the evidence, I find it convincing that that is the case. Uh, obviously, we need more evidence. We need more evidence for virtually everything. Uh, but particularly in the case of something like e-cigarettes, which is relatively new. It's a new phenomenon in, in a sense. Uh, when I look at the evidence, what strikes me as most important is that I can cite five to six completely different kinds of evidence that e-cigarettes are helping adults to quit smoking. So we know from the relatively small literature on randomized controlled trials that e-cigarettes appear to be more effective than FDA approved nicotine replacement therapy products like patch and gum. Uh, that's been that's been repeated in multiple studies now and uh, seems to be pretty well established. In addition, however, if we look at population studies, we have evidence from both the UK and the US that the smoking cessation rate has increased during the period of vaping's ascendancy. 
Whether it's caused by vaping per se, we can't say. We do know from population studies that frequent vapors have a higher smoking cessation rate than people who do not vape at all. Conversely, infrequent vapors have a lower cessation rate. So that's a phenomenon we need to study better, understand, uh, and figure out whether people who are vaping a lot and end up quitting smoking more, it's simply because they like vaping more, or is it simply the frequency with which they're using the product? We need to understand that. We have sales data. We have lots of sales data that demonstrate that when sales of e-cigarettes rise, you see a decrease in sales of cigarettes and the opposite of that. Uh, we have economic studies that demonstrate quite convincingly, this is price studies and the like, quite convincingly that e-cigarettes and cigarettes are substitutes. And we have policy studies that demonstrate that some of the consequences of policies that are very well-intentioned are most unfortunate and suggest that people, both kids and adults, are substituting cigarettes for e-cigarettes when policies stamp down on e-cigarettes. Well, and that's a perfect time to jump into some of the recommendations in this paper because that's the price issue, is it not? Definitely. So why the four Ps of marketing? Why apply those to vaping? I think it's innovative. These are the four Ps for marketing a product, but they're also conveniently the four areas in which you can have policies to try to discourage their use. So Ken, you led a group of 15 past presidents from the Society on Research from Nicotine and Tobacco, um, and we covered that. That was out last summer, I believe, in the summer of 2021, and you were looking for a balanced consideration amongst the issues. This particular paper feels like it's a bit more where here are recommendations on how to solve the issue. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. That's absolutely right. The first paper, uh, which was in American Journal of Public Health in September of 2021, was intended to develop the case for a more balanced consideration of the issue of keeping kids away from e-cigarettes and getting adults to have the opportunity to use them to help them quit smoking. And we went through all the various issues, the health arguments, the issues about youth vaping and what the evidence tells us and the evidence on how e-cigarettes can help adults to quit smoking. The objective here was to take that broad perspective and to try to put it into a policy mix that allows us to address both of those issues at the same time. Under product, obviously there's something controversial in terms of the recommendations that you make. I think the first one is, is kind of obvious and that's FDA should establish product standards. There's not a lot of product standards out there. And I know that the industry has always kind of begged the regulators, let's have a discussion about product standards because there's a lot we can do there and good manufacturing practices and so forth. But it always seems to come down to the issues around uh, youth and then that is flavors. What did you address here in terms of this recommendation on flavors, which falls under product? Well, we, you know, we noted the fact that the FDA back in 2020 said that it wanted to address flavors in e-cigarettes. And what it did was it prioritized enforcement against companies selling flavored cartridge based e-cigarettes um, without without that uh, you know PMTA authorization that they were supposed to supposed to get and the agency exempted tobacco and menthol flavored cartridges and also all non-cartridge based uh, e-cigarettes so that's a you know become in fact a huge challenge out there um, you know across the US and as a result uh, the sales of exempted which are primarily disposable e-cigarettes and in fruit and dessert flavors, for example, rose uh, dramatically. And that tends to be the, the focus of the, the tobacco control community or, or groups that specifically focus on uh, issues related to kids' exposure to these products. And in fact, we, we've talked a little bit about uh, my 19-year-old. My well, he uses uh, disposables with, with a variety of flavors. So, um, you know, a lot of that comes back to 
the the challenge, and this is something I think that we're trying to uh, really reconcile here in our call for, well, reconciliation and finding common ground involving the FDA's uh, exercise of what they call enforcement discretion, which they have taken to mean, it appears, just looking in from the outside, that they're just going to let this fairly wild west of this marketplace, uh, uh, you know, continue to, to persist for, for the, the time being. And so that, you know, we've looked at the, the possibility of uh, an option that, I mean, obviously would involve a ban on all flavors in combusted products. That's actually the direction that the FDA is aiming now. Menthol and cigarettes and all flavors, including menthol uh, in cigars. But then addressing in a, a, a more APPH, appropriate for the protection of public health uh, fashion, what they should do particularly around alternative products, e-cigarettes and potentially also uh, other uh, non-inhaled nicotine-based products. And, you know, that uh, could end up eliminating the fruit and sweet flavors, but I don't think that we have said that's what you got to go do. Instead, we're saying this needs to be carefully assessed uh, by the industry, excuse me, by, by the agency, by the FDA, and, you know, to look for an effective compromise based on careful scientific review where perhaps some non-tobacco flavors are determined both to assist adults in ending combustible tobacco use at the same time that they don't unduly expose kids to risk. So the flavors obviously comes right down to it. If you ask any vapor, you know, that's been utilizing the product for any period of time, they're going to most likely tell you that it is fruit or dessert flavors are what work for them. And that's the big concern. So you're saying then that the recommendations in this paper aren't specifically nailed down to recommending a ban on fruit and dessert. However, that could still happen. Yeah, I, well, I, I think that's right. Um, I, you know, I'd also like Ken to weigh in on this, but I think that uh, what we recognize is that those are the same flavors that do appeal to adults. I think that's pretty widely understood. And that has got to uh, play a role in how this is assessed based on that AP, APPH uh, standard. And, you know, the bottom line is we have talked here about a comprehensive set of recommendations. They shouldn't be taken in a siloed fashion. They should be considered synergistically together so that if you have restrictions on place, where these products are sold, how they're sold, one would think hypothetically or more than hypothetically that if you've got strong enforcement around that, you've got strong regulation around where these products can be obtained lawfully, then that opens the door to having a wider menu of products available to those who can access those places. In other words, you know, adults, 20 in the US, 21 uh, and over. So that would help answer the question. It isn't solely a function of what the products themselves contain or, or what they're called and so on. So let's jump then to uh, place because that is connected to uh, the flavor issue. And in your recommendations, uh, you state restrict the sale of all tobacco and nicotine products other than NRT to adult only 21 plus retail outlets. So that could be vape shops or tobacconists. So is that really the idea here is that um, maybe there could be flavors if for adults, if they're only sold in adult only locations. Yeah, that's kind of an example. That, that's an example of a proposal that no one will like. Uh, it, it, it has negatives for smokers and adult users of other tobacco products because it makes products a little less accessible. They can't go into gas station convenience store and get them. Uh, it certainly will not satisfy people who are concerned about youth access because they figure as long as they're sold, say the fruit and dessert flavors, there's still gonna be some adults who go into the store and buy it for the kids. Uh, we have to recognize that there's no policy no set of policies we can establish that are going to get rid of absolutely everything that you know all kids would use, or for that matter, they're going to make everything available for all adults. We have to be looking for compromises here. And the place one, uh, 
I think this is frankly a terrific idea. Uh, Abigail Friedman and I have uh, an opinion piece in New England Journal of Medicine that preceded this uh, paper that discussed this idea. Um, I think it's a, a really good idea and it's something the states could do individually. They have the right to establish state stores, for example. Uh, there could be obviously vape shops or tobacconists that are age 21 only anyway. So they would be eligible for it. But you're going to find lots of objection to it from, from some very substantial economic interests, um, you know, the, all the major retailers, even I hate to say it, some of the pharmaceutical or pharmacies that still sell cigarettes, uh, certainly the convenience stores, which has a big political lobby. Um, and it may be very difficult to get that kind of a measure through. Then you have to step back and have something that's restrictive, but not that restrictive. So maybe it's not an adult only store, but you make sure that only adults have access to the product and only adults can see the product when it's brought out from under the counter. And there's no advertising for it in or around the store. There, there are modifications on this that can be undertaken that could be very useful. Now, let me ask um, then about price. What, you know, what are the issues around price? I mean, I guess basically that just is a discussion about tax, is it not? It is, it is primarily a discussion about tax. And thus far, what we have is a few states that have started, had have adopted taxes on e-cigarettes. Uh, and in many instances, they're trying to get the equivalent tax to that they already impose on cigarettes. The original Build Back Better bill had a provision to do precisely that. It was going to increase or establish, I should say, a tax uh, on e-cigarettes that was intended to be the equivalent of the tax on cigarettes. And that would have exactly the wrong effects. So what we really want to look for is if you want to impose a small tax on e-cigarettes to discourage their use by kids who are the most price sensitive users, then do it. But make sure that you significantly increase the tax on cigarettes and other combusted tobacco products, because when you do that, you create an incentive for smokers to think about using the less expensive product, the e-cigarette, and to give up the cigarettes. Kids are going to be disincentivized from using both of them, and in particular, the more dangerous products, cigarettes, because the price, the tax, and the price are going to be much higher. So when we have examples like the state of Minnesota, which adopted an e-cigarette tax without increasing its cigarette tax, uh, commensurate by, I don't think they increased it at all at that time, what we observed from a study from the National Bureau of Economic Research is that there was an increase in smoking among adults in Minnesota and a decrease in smoking cessation. Writ large, a tax on e-cigarettes that was the equivalent of a tax on cigarettes nationwide would substantially decrease the rate of smoking cessation in the United States and frankly increase the death rate. So while an e-cigarette tax may be well-intentioned, you have to put it in context. It needs to be small because the risk is small relative to the tax that you impose on combusted tobacco products because they're very dangerous. And let me just throw this out to both of you, and Cliff, maybe you can jump in on this. Isn't it tobacco control 101 to levy large taxes on cigarette products? And that definitely will make a difference in terms of cutting down smoking. It, it is. I, I think, in fact, Brent, that if you looked at the, the top priorities of tobacco control now for many, many years, uh, that would be number one. That probably is number one with smoke-free policies to follow and other measures like reducing marketing. So if you apply then large taxes to e-cigarettes, if tobacco control is pushing that forward, then they, you'd have to assume, of course, that it's going to trigger a substitution. You know, there, there's a couple of things that I've been thinking about as you've been walking through this. And they have they, they sort of uh, align with our focus on accurate health communications. We've talked a little bit about the fact that there's a huge focus on nicotine 
and nicotine being demonized. Well, if it's nicotine in one product, an e-cigarette, and it's nicotine in a cigarette, if your focus is on nicotine, then you're not going to consider them to be terribly different. And in fact, many people have been misled. They've been misinformed and, and uh, inferred that in some cases, folks think e-cigarettes are worse than combustible tobacco products. And there is no science that would in any way whatsoever justify that, that misperception. But that's what people think. And in the discourse, there's a lot of conflation of all tobacco products. You'll hear, for example, in the U.S., there are 480,000 tobacco-related deaths every single year. Well, guess what? Virtually all of those 480,000 deaths are from smoking. They're from using burned combustible tobacco products. But the discussion often conflates all of this. And so why wouldn't advocates think, well, we should just raise taxes on everything? Because there's no real distinction drawn among the different products across that very long and significant continuum of risk that ranges from NRT all the way on the one end to say Marlboro all the way uh, on the other end. I'll add one more bit of information here, which I think is significant. Uh, there is huge concern about exposure to nicotine and guess what that's done from a traditional cessation perspective or tobacco control perspective is it has served as a disincentive to people to use nicotine gum or nicotine patches because they're afraid that it will harm them, even though in the US, the FDA regulates and approves those not only as effective, but, but as safe. So the communication around this is a critical feature. And I think that's why, and what I was getting at earlier in the interview when I was mentioning you know, the demonization of nicotine, because it seems to have changed in nature because for the longest time, public health you know, was happy to be talking about NRT and so forth. And, and now it is does make that troublesome. Let me throw this at both of you and then we'll see who wants to jump in first on it. This is directly from this current paper. To date, nearly all public service e-cigarette messaging in the U.S. focuses on risks to youth. Misleading messages contribute, contribute to the public's dramatic overestimate, overestimation of the risks of e-cigarettes, including FDA ads depicting their use as metaphorically causing parasitic infestation of the brains of youth. We've talked about that lots. And the truth initiatives communicating inaccurately in the articles on its website that the use of e-cigarettes causes depression. As a consequence of one-sided, often misleading messaging, many adults who smoke perceive e-cigarettes as being as dangerous or as more dangerous than conventional cigarettes. Smoking attributed, attributed deaths, therefore, may be more numerous than if consumers were accurately informed. That says to me, and it reads exactly you know, how I believe it is as truth, is that it is public health and the regulator um, and volu non, you know, voluntary organizations that are pushing all of this out there and are responsible for this misinformation. There are a lot of stakeholders. There are a lot of actors in, in all of this. And, and what you've just quoted from, Brent, uh, aligns with some of what I was discussing about the, the challenge in accurate communications here and the fact that it has a direct impact on public perceptions and then by extension on health behavior. So, you know, the reality is that uh, there has been a, a lot of, I'll call it misinformation or kind of imperfect information or uh, partial information that has been, I think, communicated by public health or, or, or government health regulators, by public health slash tobacco control organizations, by various individuals who have, uh, you know, uh, loud microphones. And, you know, it's not on, only one sided. I mean, there are those on the, the harm reduction side who will overstate, for example, um, I think facts around safety involving e-cigarettes. Uh, I, I don't think anyone should claim these products are simply safe. Uh, they are, I think, demonstrably less hazardous. Uh, we don't have an exact percentage, even though exact percentages are, are suggested sometimes. So I think probably everyone or many of us involved in this, no matter how strongly we feel about it and the outcomes we would like, uh, should step back and, and attempt to be a little bit more measured. And that will contribute, by the way, by extension to finding that common ground, because there's going to be then a little less Twitterization of all of this, a little less yelling 
around it and a little bit more coming to the table and, and discussing it. But I, I have been concerned, as I've said, for quite some time that on the tobacco control side, you know, the side, if you will, hate to refer to sides that, that, that I came from, uh, there has been an overstatement and a conflation uh, of all of these products as being, you know, pretty much horrible. And then it gets back to the to the demonization of the the misrepresentation of the the impact of nicotine, which in fact, by the way, can be an enormously helpful substance uh, when used in some of these products. There's an epidemic spreading. Scientists say it can change your brain. It can release dangerous chemicals like formaldehyde into your bloodstream. It can expose your lungs to acrolein, which can cause irreversible damage. It's not a parasite, not a virus, not an infection. It's vaping. I developed a, a very intriguing insight talking to an FDA official about the ads where they have the parasitic worms crawling through people's faces and brains. And uh, what he told me was that they worked very carefully to make sure that these ads were targeted very specifically at kids and would be seen predominantly by kids. And my response to him was, I saw a lot of them and I don't watch a lot of kids shows. Uh, so they weren't effectively targeted. But they certainly were, if to the extent that they work on kids, they would also work on adult smokers. They would feed this concern that is widely held that e-cigarettes are as dangerous or more dangerous than cigarettes. Uh, it's, it's hard to believe that a majority of adults believe that and that it's gotten worse year by year. Those numbers have gone up over time. So people are getting increasingly misled. The media, the public, the conversation is clearly very one-sided at this point. That's been documented in a number of studies of uh, looking at the media. Uh, one of the values of that paper that the past presidents of the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco wrote is to demonstrate that it was about two thirds of the available or eligible past presidents of the society co-authored that paper. These are prominent, scientists in the field who are highly respected by their scientific colleagues. And two thirds of them were basically taking the position that was adopted in that paper. And I think that tells you there is a big difference between the debate and discussion in the scientific community and what we're seeing in the public media. Let me just say that what's, what's so frustrating is that um, in the last several years, of course, certainly with what the world's been through in the last two years, we really do rely on public health because they have a massive impact on day-to-day -day life, the economy, even mobility and freedom. And so when we're exposed to what seems to be an, an obstinate um, and transient position when it comes to, say, this issue, it's hard to not think that that is then also going on in other areas of public health that may even be more life and death than tobacco control. Well, we've certainly seen that in the area of COVID. Uh, the public was badly misled by the previous administration uh, on COVID. And it turned out that that influenced the way a lot of public health departments and CDC were permitted to talk about the issue. And uh, CDC is now trying to rectify the situation, but uh, they gave them, they stained the image of the public health community in, in a very fundamental way because they were taking their cues from the leadership of the previous administration. That's absolutely true. We talk a lot about this, by the way, Brent. You know, I mean, it, it, it brings to mind the, that old parable about the boy who cried wolf. And the fact is, is that uh, since the CDC has said some things along the way for the reasons and political reasons that, that Ken was just highlighting that were demonstrably misleading and made it more difficult for the public to, to know the truth about how best to protect itself from this, this new virus. The fact is that when the CDC then gives you good information 
say nine out of 10 times. Well, those nine real times are not going to be believed because of the one that, you know, has has set everyone off in, in the wrong direction. And I, you know, I just think that uh, as a result, when we look at the area of e-cigarettes and harm reduction, it's another clear and very significant example of where we need government, government health authorities to be sharing clear, accurate information. And, and going back to the metaphorical, although they, they were actually presented as being kind of real, you know, parasitic entities uh, uh, on the brain, that, that sort of thing may in fact deter kids from vaping. And I think it probably is effective in that narrow sense. But if it's seen by everyone else and it's not placed in any kind of real context as to the, the larger you know, factors around these products and the role or roles that they can play, particularly for those tens of millions of inveterate adult smokers, then, then you really do have a problem. And I think that that's a ship that should be not all that difficult to write, but we're still working on it. So the, the recommendation then that I love coming out of this, mm -hmm. that's in the paper, is limit e-cigarette advertising to mm -hmm. a switch message uh, in accordance with the continuation continuum of risk. And I love that because of course, currently right now, you can't do any messaging. Uh, promoting the switch. That, that's absolutely correct. And it, it's it's part of the interesting story of Jewel, because there's no doubt in my mind that Jewel's behavior early on was reprehensible in terms of the social media with regard to Jewel with kids and in effect marketing to kids, along with lots of other company, vaping companies that were marketing to kids. Uh, and when they got their wrist slapped, and it was actually a little more than having their wrist slapped, uh, they turned their behavior around and became what I think is the model company for e-cigarettes because they stopped selling the flavored ones because they didn't want to worry about kids using flavored ones. Uh, they stopped all of the social media that they could. It was addressing kids. They stopped their marketing that could be going toward kids. And then what they did, which I thought was the exactly right thing to do, is they started advertising Jewel as a substitute for cigarettes for middle-aged, there was, there was one that I loved, this middle-aged, bald, fat guy wearing a wife beater undershirt. That's who they were advertising to. And he had this quizzical look on his face when the message was switch. And I thought that's exactly what you should be saying. And the FDA came down on them hard and said, that looks like it's a health message. You cannot use that message until you get our permission to do so. But they're not, you know, they, they've just made it very difficult to get permission to do pretty much anything. That brings me to my next question. And as we're getting towards wrapping up here, is that aren't all of these recommendations predicated solely on FDA getting through whatever issues it's having? Because currently right now they're denying almost all of the products and then and that's just allowing them to be on the market. That's it's a that's a trouble. And then once they are, then there's still all of the regulations around in terms of what companies can say in the marketplace. So, I mean, how can any of this stuff get worked out in the middle ground uh, as the FDA is currently on its track? Well, first of all, you need you need you need to recognize that not all of these recommendations are addressed to the FDA at all. So FDA has no authority over taxation whatsoever. That's up to the states and the federal government. Uh, communications can be done at all kinds of levels. I mean, let's face it, their CDC has campaigns, states have campaigns. There are all kinds of organizations that can do communications. Uh, the rule on where products can be sold, adult only establishments, for example, can be established by the states. So there are a limited number of these measures that are specific to FDA, but definitely not all of them. But doesn't it come down to, though, if FDA doesn't grant mar marketing authorization, at some point, aren't all the products supposed to be removed from the marketplace? Sure. A absolutely right. And uh, I I'd say we're all holding our breath to find out where they're going to go with the remaining products. But we'd be long dead if we held our breath that long. <laughs> Well, and that, uh, yeah, and that is definitely one of the issues because um, it and 
why I kind of thought that maybe vaping might be too big to fail is because it seems that the FDA hasn't cleared the market. Now, uh, Alex Norsha from Filter this week has just come out with a story saying that FDA has indeed uh, instructed the DOJ to start taking action along this matter. What do we know about that? We know that the Department of Justice uh, at the FDA's behest sent a, a letter to uh, one producer in Arizona and basically instructed it to cease and, and desist from its illegal sales. Um, to give you an idea though of, of the way this process has been working, that's one that we've become aware of. How many sellers are out there across the country and how much of, of this essentially free market is taking place right now. Well, there's a great deal. So is that just really an example of an action? Is it is it a sign of a, any kind of new trend getting underway? We, we just don't know, but I'll tell you that that seller in Arizona received a warning letter originally in August of 2021. So this letter now follows a little bit more than a year later to tell them to stop doing what they were doing. So kind of on its face, it doesn't suggest some new aggressive tack. So we, we really do have to see what happens. But we also have the problem that FDA doesn't have the ability to enforce all of the requirements that they impose on these companies, the, you know, the orders not to produce or not to sell. They just don't have the wherewithal to do that. They're gonna be very reliant, whether it's on DOJ or local authorities or whatever to do that. And uh, that's another thing that's in our paper is a discussion of licensing. We don't go into it in great detail, but the states and localities can handle much of this through licensing operations. And uh, we recommend a much stronger set of robust licensing and enforcement uh, than what we've observed to date in the states. And that's a way you could address this sort of thing. So I get the sense here that this is a pragmatic, realistic approach saying that it looks, apparently it looks that maybe potentially FDA and states are not gonna be able to clear the market of vaping products. So if that's the case, if there's going to be product out there that doesn't necessarily have been granted the marketing authorization from FDA, here's a bunch of other things that not the FDA could do to help mitigate and, and get control of the issue. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Like here is a plan for a world in which not all product has been uh, approved by the FDA. Well, it's certainly not. It's certainly not a world in which all of them have been rejected or the vast majority have been rejected and those products are no longer sold. It does envision a world in which there will be reduced risk products, including e-cigarettes. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying hard to remain optimistic that FDA will understand the value of e-cigarettes for adult smokers to help them to quit smoking and the importance of that, the relative importance of getting adults to quit. They're the people Adult smokers are the people who are going to die as a result of their smoking. It's not a 15 year old who's vaping for one or two times. Uh, the, the kid like Cliff's son, 19 year olds and vaping frequently, that's a worry. But even that person is not at the same level of risk as an adult smoker. And if we can increase the, the rate of smoking cessation by 10%, 15%, 20%. That's a huge public health achievement. And I just hope that FDA will get back to the point of recalling what they said, and I think it was November of 2017, about developing a comprehensive nicotine policy that would include uh, one of the things we haven't even discussed. And that's the idea of reducing nicotine in combusted tobacco products to levels that are incapable of sustaining addiction. But you can't do that unless at the same time you have alternative nicotine delivery products that are less hazardous, but they're appealing to consumers. I hope they'll get around to that.